Has a Ritraka, they can't hear us. Can they hear us? Or we are, can we hear you? Sorry. Uh, can, no. can participants hear me yet? No? Yes. I. They, they should be able to do that. Yeah. Because well, well, I now... wanted to ask you something. So it doesn't matter. I'll ask you later. I'll ask you. Later. <laughs> okay. No worries. Yeah. So uh, I think, yeah, we, we, the, the clock is struck six. So I think I'll start. So I'm just going to ask you something on the. Yeah. yeah. Please. Please. Of course. Wait for a minute. <laughs> Where are you based, Ritvika? Uh, I'm in Delhi. I'm actually in Delhi. Yeah. We both, and you're in Pune. Mr. I'm in Pune. But Mr. Chawla should also be in Delhi, I guess, or... No, I came to Jaipur day before. So I have an there. NGO here for a hundred disabled kids. Yes, and yes. I hadn't been here since March. Okay. So my teachers had started online teaching in June. And uh, so uh, we found that, you know, we have a hundred kids and uh, the parents are basically daily labor. So mm -hmm. I came on a begging mission to All try right. and collect laptops and iPads and uh, people's phones so that if I can equip all my hundred kids, then our classes can go properly online, right. you know, from 10 to three. So today I was begging. So that's <laughs> why I'm So uh, I think we'll just start on- Sure, bit. sure, whenever you are ready, no problem. Yeah, we have a few attendees. Um, I'll just start with this. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ritvika Sharma, and I lead uh, with his Constitutional Law Center, Charkha. Uh, I'm very pleased to be welcoming everyone to this dialogue on uh, gauging the health of India's electoral democracy. Uh, this dialogue is the last of four events which were part of the two-day-long Samvidhan Summit. Uh, we had a hands full on day two of the summit with a dialogue in the morning on uh, presumption of innocence in the Constitution. Just about half an hour back, we wrapped up a master class on India's COVID-19 response and federalism, which was taken by Dr. Louis Tillin from the King's India Institute. Uh, to wrap up the day, we are now starting a dialogue on gauging uh, the health of India's electoral democracy. Uh, I want to extend a very warm welcome uh, to our panelists today. We have uh, Mr. Naveen Chavla. Uh, Mr. Chavla uh, was a former chief election is a chief former elect former chief election commissioner of India. Uh, he took over as CEC in 2009. Oh, and during his tenure, uh, he successfully completed to national and international acclaim the general elections in April to May 2009. Uh, and initiated several important reforms. Uh, we also have Dr. Suhas Palshikar. Um, Dr. Palshikar uh, taught political science at the Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. Uh, he's co-director of the research program on comparative democracy at Lok Niti, located at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. And he's also the chief editor of the journal, uh, Studies in Indian Politics. We also have with us Dr. Shruti Kapila. Uh, Dr. Kapila is Associate Professor of Modern History and Politics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's the editor of An Intellectual History for India and the co-editor of Political Thought and Action, The Bhagavad Gita and Modern India. Uh, and Dr. Kapila, we're eagerly awaiting the release of your book, uh, Violent Fraternity in the Indian Age, which uh, I suppose is slated for release in 2021. Yes, well, um, yeah. it finally is here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're eagerly awaiting Dr. Kapila. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for agreeing to uh, be, participate in this panel. Um, so I'll jump into this straight away. Uh, we can reserve uh, the final 15 minutes of this discussion uh, for a Q&A from our attendees. Uh, before that, we could have possibly a 45 minute long discussion on a few uh, aspects that we can take up. So let's jump uh, right at it. Um, so while well, thinking about how to open up today's discussion, um, I did not have to go too far because two elections, one each in the US and one closer home in Bihar, uh, both are still fresh in our collective memories. Um, social media was recently abuzz with comments, uh, some of them possibly made in jest, uh, some others made in all seriousness about what possibly um, the process of organizing and conducting elections in the US could emulate from the Election Commission of India. Um, without dwelling into the specifics of that comparison, what I do want to get in uh, is the pivotal role that the ECI has played in maintaining India's electoral democracy and good health. 
Um, besides ensuring smooth conduct of elections, uh, the perception of the ECI being a truly independent institution is what puts it at the center of electoral democracy in India. And it is an institution uh, that people truly believe in. Uh, an important plank that I believe on which the independence of the institution rests is the independence of the people who man it, uh, which brings me to my point about independence of the two election commissioners. And because we have Mr. Naveen Chavla here, I think that's a point that we can possibly ponder over a bit. Um, Mr. Chavla, you've written about this in your book, your book, uh, Every Vote Counts, uh, about extension of constitutional protection enjoyed by the chief election commissioner to the other two ECs. Uh, so we would, I think we would greatly benefit if you could provide us some context on what the provision of constitutional protection in terms of conditions of service, also in terms of removability from office, would mean in practice for the institution of the ECI as such. So if you could just provide some perspective there. Well, I think it's a very fundamental question and one which was, in which I was deeply involved and continue to be because I believe it is pivotal to the true independence of the election commission. You see, when the election commission was set up at that time, there wasn't any need, the constitution makers didn't feel that there was need for election commissioners. One chief election commissioner would suffice and should the, uh, the CEC at that time or the government at that time feel that they needed one or two to buttress them uh, during the course of elections, then one or two could be co-joined for a limited period. But you know, from the time that uh, the Congress monolith began to break and other political parties started coming up, then uh, assemblies um, and the center uh, and parliament, uh, their terms no longer began to coincide. It was at that time that uh, two, uh, two commissioners, two extra commissioners were thought of. And finally, after many hiccups, uh, they were appointed. Um, that also meant with Mr. Session went to the Supreme Court and so on, but that's in the book. And, uh, and finally, it was, um, there was parity to the extent that two commissioners could overrule the CEC. But while there was parity in pay and emoluments and, and these conditions, that last mile, I think, got crucially left behind, which is while the CEC has the protection, it, it's very difficult to remove the CEC because it means two-thirds uh, impeachment in parliament by two-thirds members present in voting, the election commissioners can be removed by the government seeking the concurrence of the CEC. And in my case, the CEC thought he had the powers, but then that was sort of clarified by the government in a sort of messy way. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, all the attempts that have been made since 1999, by all the chief commission, election commissioners to all the prime ministers and governments of the day have met with the same fate, which is that the government of the day does not want to give the two election commissioners the same protection from removal. And now, if they don't have that, then they're either looking over the left shoulder at what government is thinking or looking over the right shoulder to see what their boss, the CEC, is thinking, when actually they shouldn't be the system of a boss because it's he's just primus inter pares, the first among sequels. So this very important last mile, which even came up in 2016 before the Supreme Court in um, PIL, was unfortunately not given the consideration that it should have been given. And I feel that this is a huge lacuna. I see. Uh, Mr. Chawla, um, a follow up question to that, and I would also want um, Dr. Balchikar to come in and address this question is uh, firstly, what kind of uh, problems would such protection for ECs address? You've, you've partly already addressed that. But where I'm trying to come from is um, the uh, the, the, the Election Commission of India enjoys a certain uh, public perception. Uh, and I was reading this, um, this uh, rather, so, I, I was reading Bruce Ackerman's uh, essay called The New Separation of Powers, which has a rather sobering, but a slightly uplifting uh, extract, which says, despite India's well-deserved reputation for corruption, the commission has been a vital force in sustaining, the election commission has been a vital 
vital force in sustaining the credible operation of the electoral process. So um, the two things that come to my mind is, uh, of course, uh, the perception of independence, the perception of impartiality uh, has a lot to do uh, with uh, the kind of emoluments, the kind of conditions of service, uh, all terms with respect to removal of election commissions are also concerned. So, sir, I would really like you to address uh, what sort of problems would this address if the, if the election commissioners also have the same kind of constitution protection? Well, first, I'd just like to presage this slightly by saying that I've been uh, observer to many countries uh, during the time that I was in office and, and, and since then. Uh, and the wonderful thing about the Indian machine is that we've been able to conduct elections on time, every time. And, and the result of that election, whether it's a state assembly election or whether it's the election to parliament, or the president, the vice president, we're not concerned with panchayat elections, yeah. uh, have been accepted by the people of India and not just the people of India. The party that has lost or the candidate that has lost has accepted the result with the same grace. And that's a very big thing. Right. And I've been to many, many countries where that has not been accepted at all. And of course, we're seeing what's happening in the US, which is, you know, one of the world's biggest or oldest or whatever the terms are for democracy, but we're seeing what a mess there is. And I can also tell you that I don't think that the Election Commission of India would have made the mess in 2000 that took place in Florida uh, either. Uh, so there are many strengths, but there are some weaknesses. We give tickets to criminal candidates. We spend money way over what we should be spending. These aren't good things. They are unhealthy practices and they're not getting much healthier. They're only getting unhealthier because elections are becoming more expensive. But in all this, there are many reforms that we need and the election commission is constantly writing to the government of the day and our list of reforms becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. I think on last count it was 27. Um, but it's very often a case of apply, apply, no reply, um, because parliament and government, in a way, have the same attitude to the election commission, irrespective of whichever government comes. But having said that, if I can get the help of Sohasji, who's here, on this panel, and perhaps Madam Kapila, then we can and if we're on the same page, we can at least attempt uh, through the Supreme Court uh, bringing about some of these reforms. Good, sir. I but no, the election commissioners must be protected from looking over their shoulders because you haven't done 37 years in the IAS and four years in the election commission for you to necessarily, all three of you, think the same way as your boss is thinking. That's not why you were appointed. And the CEC is only primus inter Paris. Right. So we come with our own minds, we come with our experiences, and if those aren't put together uh, in, on an equal platform, I dissented many times, and I dissented in writing, and I gave my reasons. I didn't make a fuss about it, but it's on record, uh, but I have the right to dissent. Right. And, um, and I should have the right to dissent without worrying whether you know my salary is coming tomorrow or not. I understand. So, so um, I would actually like to move to Dr. Palshikar now. Uh, and um, Dr. Palshikar, uh, my, my opening question to you is that the reputation of, of the Election Commission of India as a credible institution, um, as, as, as an institution with a lot of integrity. Uh, so how do you think that plays out in public perception? And in a way, what I'm trying to ask is, uh, does, does the nearly impeccable reputation of the ECI encourage citizens to be more effective participants in a democracy? And how is the ECI playing out as a site for democratic participation, uh, assuming it is? Mm -hmm. you know, the first part of your question is easy to answer, that in public perception, the Election Commission of India has earned a certain trust and confidence. And uh, even in most of our studies, uh, we always keep asking this question, 
uh, about trust in institutions and the election commission normally along with the supreme court uh, is at the top as far as people's trust in institutions is concerned but if you give i give you the 2019 figures at the time of the elections when we ask this question uh, something that should concern the election commission is that there are still at least one person in every six that is 15 16% who don't have much trust in the election commission so there is actually something to be still achieved and the advent uh, of the electronic voting machine has both added to the glamour of the election commission but at the same time it has added to many technical and legal issues that have arisen out of it particularly because of this pinginess of the election commission in accepting how many vv pads should be matched uh, at the time of counting i think the election commission has lost an opportunity there uh, to enhance its prestige uh, and uh, that might have longer repercussions because all political parties are now ganging up in order to demolish the idea of having an electronic voting machine uh, you mentioned this question of electoral reforms if electoral reforms were to take place i think main hurdle is that there must be some kind of a bridge between the electro, uh, election commission and the political parties and since we don't have that bridge since they look upon each other as adversaries and most election commissioners uh, pardon me mr chawla uh, they might not say it in so many words but they have this attitude of holier than thou which creates a bridge between a kind of a chasm between the parties after all there are parties which we know that they are not going to easily accept limitations on their powers and you have to bell the cat so if you want electoral reforms i wouldn't go to the supreme court i would argue argue and argue with political parties because unless there is public pressure absolutely unless i as a citizen believe that this is something wrong i don't think these reforms would take place very easily otherwise the reforms that supreme court has ordained like the affidavits they are a joke the affidavits that people give and the incomes that they tell and the occupations that they record in their affidavits so i think we have to move forward beyond structures structures are fine and since we are on structures when just last point i agree with mr chawla on the protection that the other election commissioner should have but i have an additional point to that which is that the appointment should not be in the hands of the government mm -hmm. it must be consultative process either mm -hmm. what we call in us as a bipartisan in india it cannot be bipartisan but there must be some such provision by which you consult the leader of the opposition in the parliament and in the case of the state election commission mr chawla you should actually uh, uh, throw light on that as well later on but the situation is even more pathetic where the state election commissions don't have even enough office staff leave aside autonomy uh, so i think these are structural issues and i think the combination of structural and process related issues creates problems as well as so far it has created some kind of goodwill for the election commission and frankly i would say that it is up to the election commission actually to retain that goodwill not the political parties the onus is on the election commission i agree and then thank you thanks dr pajkar dr kapila i would come to you now and uh, i actually want to come to you from a slightly historical perspective because i feel it's important to ask if there's a certain specific point in the history of independent india when the eci assumed this position of uh, a referee institution which can ably carry out the task of conducting and overseeing elections uh, in a country as populous and diverse as ours and possibly i'm going back in time further back in time from tn session possibly even behind where the eci sort of assumed this role and assumed uh, this position of neutrality um, and integrity in public perception so uh, any thoughts on coming from a historical perspective when exactly this sort of happened yeah. Well thank you very much and it's a great honor and delight uh, to be in such eminent company i mean you know Mr. Chawla is sort of one of the our stars of indian democracy and of course dr paul shakur is a great uh, analyst and i'm mostly a historian of political ideas so and also indian democracy so i take a slightly different view in, rather than the kind of everyday functioning of the institution 
I think that there is a kind of structural feature which something that actually Dr. Palchiku is beginning to, uh, to articulate between as it were elected power in India and unelected powers of democracy, which is to say Supreme Court, ECI particularly. Right, and this is not simply the debate you see between executive, legislature, and and judiciary, which is also an issue, particularly from Mrs. Gandhi's period of time. But I think fundamentally, I think India, democ India's democracy, fuck, suffers from two aspects: one of deep deinstitutionalization, which constantly is taking place, while there is deepening of democracy. Now, this may sound paradoxical, but the, when you have actually multi-party systems parties coming, you also see the rise of unelected institutions gaining power and prestige. I'm thinking about the Supreme Court, but also the Election Commission of India. And here, I think the cutoff point is the way in which post the Janata Party regime and the rise of uh, Mrs. Gandhi again in the 1980s, the way as it were the Supreme Court clawed back some of its power and prestige is also similar to, as it were, what happens to the rise of the ECI, particularly under uh, session, but also this is, so this is a kind of, as it were, waxing and waning legacy of the emergency in Indian democracy. But that would be just one side of the picture. The other side of the picture really is democratization, which does not really fit easily into the institutional unfolding of power. And I think uh, this is a really important point that has been re refers to reforms, because uh, this is something that has been raised very eloquently just now by Dr. Palshikar, that without political parties taken into proper consultation or integrated into it, it is meaningless. Because, you know, uh, whether it's a matter of trust or whether it is, uh, so it's not simply that people just accept the results. We can, you know, with all due respect to Mr. Chavla, you know, I think some of the celebration in the Indian Twitter sphere after the American results was a bit hypocritical in the sense it was also like a kind of naive nationalism because you know I'm not saying that the Americans are great but our system has its problems right I mean the question of EVMs has been it may be a bogey but it it it, it, it is one on the table but okay be that as may as it may but I think there is a tussle in India between elected and unelected powers, di different aspects of democracy. And in terms of reform, I don't see how the election commission reform uh, can be delinked from how we will think about party funding, how we will think how parties are funded and how they are accounted for. Already affidavits and, or, and the like have been raised that they are ritualistic. You know, be all the pol pol political uh, people one knows or you know, people who run for parliament or MLAs or even Zilla Parish and stuff, they have their lawyers, they know what to do, they, they game it. But the issue is party funding. I think the central issue is since we, cut, since we cannot have that structure in place, everything else I think is secondary. And I don't want to hog too much here, but I think that leads also to the question of the way in which not just old parties, new parties which are coming up, how they may be funded. So how does actually this multiple you know, multi-party democracy. How is it going to fund itself? And, and in a way, India's democratic credentials will become weaker. It's not simply going to be a matter of whether elections are counted up then, right? If there is too much muscle power to one party, too much media attention to one party, uh, then in effect, everything else becomes subservient. All other institutions would become subservient uh, to that. But, you know, I return that to the to the panel because I think the problem is not ECI and the problem is institution versus democratization and and that doesn't have an easy fit and and and, and actually has been moving in opposite directions since at least the 1980s and the rise of multi-party democracy in India. I'm uh, actually very happy that you've spoken about electoral funding because, uh, and I think the fixation with results and fixation with uh, achieving a certain number sort of does not take us away, but uh, maybe at least in public perception takes away the attention from issues such as, as you just mentioned, money power in politics, electoral funding. Uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Palshikar, I also want to come back to you for one, uh, for a quick comment on electoral funding and the way in which electoral funding or party funding currently happens. Uh, I, I would I'd like to ask two questions with respect to that. First of all, 
uh, what sort of practical role do we actually see money playing in the electoral process? And secondly, uh, the role, again, the practical role that it plays in determining electoral and governance outcomes. So the way currently how funding's happening, how exactly is it determining these two factors? Hmm. Okay, the quick answer is that yes, money matters because the scale of India's electorate constituencies is such and I'm not counting any malpractices in this. <laughs> Simply the fact that you have to do a campaign for a constituency as large as so many lakhs, that is to say, or almost up to a million voters, uh, means that you have to have huge amounts of funds. Plus, you have to run the party on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Therefore, electoral funding and political funding is central. But what have we done about it? Yes. Uh, the question, for example, of electoral bonds has been very critically examined by many scholars, experts, legal experts, and A, the government doesn't budge, B, the court doesn't even try to look at it. Now, with these two not looking at it, I think we can't even handle the question of electoral funding because we are worse now than what we were 10 years ago or five years ago yeah. in terms of the secrecy and one-sidedness which is associated with electoral funding. Either you have to have state funding or you have to have just an open door policy to give uh, whoever gives to be listed. But the point is that at least the minimum and the immediate is the veil of secrecy around electoral funding has to be definitely removed as immediately as possible. That would at least give us some sense of respectability to the idea that we are conducting elections in a kind of level playing field. They are never a level playing field anyway. I understand, sir. So, uh, should we, Dr. Kapila, I would want to come back to you. Uh, and um, you, you, you spoke about multi-party uh, democracy in India and how uh, that possibly uh, the whole uh, issue of uh, democratization and criminalization going hand in hand. Um, one thing, one, one thought that I've had here is uh, generally it, it is a multi-party democracy and uh, we, we see several uh, contenders in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, as we, as we mentioned in our first pass for the post system, there is a certain fixation with numbers. Uh, so in that context, how representative can a representative democracy actually be considered? Mm -hmm. uh, considering, yes, well, it's, it's, it's like getting past the post and that's pretty much all we want. And I know the easy answer to that is always been maybe we switch, switch, switch systems, go from FPTP to possibly PR. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's just trading. Uh, I mean, I don't want to say it like that, but maybe trading one system for the other and yes. adopting its, uh, uh, its its own criticisms. So uh, any thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on yeah, I mean, that? Okay, it's actually two questions, and I don't want to say too much because there are many things that can be said about these two very large uh, things. One is actually the question of criminalization, the so-called criminalization going hand in hand at the same, or coterminous with the rise of multi-parties. And again, you know, it has been raised, it's just simply the scale. You don't have to think even about malpractice. If you've got like, you know, millions of people to reach, and even if you're a small regional party just after five or six constituencies, it's a big ask, right? To, to have, to, to actually reach out to, to people. So where is the money going to come from? And now there is very good work done by political anthropologists on you know, criminalization in Indian, Indian politics. Um, and there, as it were, you know, the, the shadow state comes in, uh, which is related both to, as it were, access to public goods, say like welfare schemes and the like, which, you know, everyday kind of corruption, but also kind of amassing of a lot of black money, which is actually required for political power. It's not, as it were, delinked from it. So it becomes a kind of very a tightly knit web of uh, web of connections, which you now can't easily systematically undo. So I think people, particularly middle class India, is always disdainful of this criminalized activity as something very pathological. But they also they a, don't see how essential it is to the running of the system, bizarrely. Yeah. That they actually need to raise this money. And secondly, you know, if I were to take it as a kind of rational view or just a slightly dispassionate view, and it's a certain level in terms of political campaigning. Um, People who, I mean, you know, they're very senior people here in the panel, they've seen many elections, but they've seen also perhaps, you know, the change in a kind of politic politician that has emerged in India, you know, from the, from not, I'm not saying they're from the grassroots or whatever, but um, 
and you know and 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 that kind of political power whether it is coming from different caste groups people who have not had historically power people who have not perhaps have had access you know very sharp e easy quick rise even our largest party is fairly recent in in it, in terms of its history of power right so that but the scale is so quick in 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 india in terms of amassing money but especially with lower caste political leaders the display of money and the display goes as an aspect of their power you can't delink that the, the you know so the idea that if they are going to look like an earnest person is actually going to be very counterproductive for their political campaigning and so i think it's a very complex issue around money around muscle power and democratization and equally i think we have not because i think that's a structural feature as i said about deinstitutionalization this question of party funding should have been central while the kind of various institutions of a democracy were being you know the constitution is very big you know why didn't we not think about this this is an how did we think that there was only going to be one party which was going to be running the show so you know there is that i think is an urgent issue on the number matter and i'll just kind of leave it there and i think and again i hope dr palchikar will uh, uh, not hold this against me but i think because he is also a member of the leading as it were uh, place on on numbers in elections in india i we look need i think part of the problem is this obsession is also been created in uh, the obsession with the number is one which is of course part of the technical story that yes you the story you need to have a majority you need to get the number but our political discourse is also now very number obsessed we are not producing ideas and i think that's a real failure of indian electoral majority democracy because i think it, you know when you look at the papers you know you just had the bihar election so either you are pr projecting some number is going to come to x caste or x party or you are analyzing why a certain number went to it afterwards right that is the sum total of political analysis and commentary in this country which is actually a disservice i think to our 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 democratic culture so this is not an you know i mean of course sophology matters and the like but we have to interrogate why we are speaking in this manner all the time and so that's i'll leave it there but that there are reasons and it it is a short road from thinking about the number to majoritarianism it is not then a big conceptual bridge so the number is actually not simply a technical uh, you know you know as i said first pass you know there's one aspect okay is this the best system for such a diverse big country that's a very big question that's another panel debate but you asked me about the number i think the question of an obsession with number is related not just to the technical aspect it is related to the way in which indians are speaking about democracy constantly and i think it is a hurdle it is also allowing for a creeping majoritarianism in the country because people are only thinking in enumerated identities you know in as it were majoritarian ideas so for that we need a new conceptual i think we need to start thinking more conceptually more in terms of ideas but i've spoken enough yeah no that's that's actually very sobering and before i move to mr chavla to have some comments on uh, generally uh, election commissions in the state but a particular would you want to uh, share your thoughts on the numbers game and uh, generally how how indians are actually thinking about elections uh, any thoughts on that hmm. well i wanted to say a few things many yes, issues please. have been raised and uh, and an, a very important one is money hmm. now the idea of state funding or the funding by the state of political parties depending on their degree of representation has been raised many times in 2006 we had a conference that uh, of all the political parties but of course there was no unanimity mm -hmm. strangely enough the smaller parties and the parties on the left said that no it will give a double advantage to the bigger and richer parties the elevate of state funding and they'll collect their own funds now the problem of money power has become so huge so surreptitious so obscene that i don't know how we can get that genie back into the bottle yes for example uh, 
yes, there is a divide between the election commission and the political parties. Yes, there shouldn't be a divide, but, but there is suspicion on both sides. There are certain laws. The election commission expects those laws to be followed. If parliament wants to amend those laws, then parliament is the forum to amend them. Parliament doesn't amend the laws. The election commission as a fair umpire must try and level the playing field according to the existing statute. But what's happening? We had a by-election in Tamil Nadu not very long ago, where I was kind of live with Rajiv Sadhisai. And what was happening before my very eyes and to my horror was 20 rupee notes were being given freely. Now every note, as you know, has a unique number. And each 20 rupee note was then after the election as a promissory note being exchanged for 10 to 15,000 rupees. Another very serious thing has gone wrong. I mean, it has gone wrong. It's another genie that can't be put back into the bottle easily. At one point of time, the political party was out there in the field saying, please take this freebie, please take that freebie. But that's not all now. According to Bhaskar Rao's studies, admittedly, with a, with a limited sample, I mean, admitted by him, at least 40 to 50% of India is expecting freebies. We want the sarees, we want the dhotis, we want the money. And if we don't get it, our panchayat uh, is calling us and saying, you may not take it, but you better come and vote. Mm. Because otherwise you're not going to get irrigation in power. I come to another point very briefly. The money power is something that we can debate for a very long time. But until there is no political will, and at the moment there is no political will, smaller party, bigger party from the left to the right, yes. there is no will. There is a public perception and a private practice on criminality. We, 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 we've read studies and I believe it. Uh, you know, as I, as, I, as I went around the country, I would try not to fly everywhere. I would try to do a couple of segments by road and suddenly, so that I would talk to the SDM, the ADM, wherever I stopped for a cup of tea, whichever official came, other people came to me. Now, as you know, as you all know, the criminal justice system in our country is completely broken down. So I'm in a village and mine is a matter of honor or mine is a matter of irrigation or, some, or mine is a land dispute. To which court am I going to go? And for how many years am I going to go there? And who's going to pay for those lawyers? We don't have answers. So we go to our local Don. Now the Don, till the 1980s, was supporting this candidate and that candidate. But his cases weren't being taken away. So he said, hello, why shouldn't I stand myself? So through the 80s and the 90s, he threw in his hat in the political ring. And today we have studies that tell us that if you have criminal cases behind you, including rape, and we've seen the Nirbhai case, in self-attested affidavits, and murder, and multiple murder, and a coity, then the chances of our winning the election go up by as much as 23%. So can things be any worse? How are we different from the favelas of Mexico? or the barrios of Venezuela, where I've been, it's the same culture. So I think there are no easy answers, but I want to say from the, on behalf of the election commission, that yes, Mr. Session was able to crack the whip because he told Narasimha Rao, you don't give me ABC, I'm not doing elections. Mr. Narasimha Rao said, okay, I'll teach you a thing or two. So by the time Mr. Session landed in Pune in an old aircraft, which took time in those days, he found at, from the press that two other commissioners had been appointed in those two hours. And so we became a triumvirate, maybe not for the right reasons. So there are so many complex issues, but money, criminality. So Hassab can be writing again and again on the, on the need to eliminate criminal candidates. But hello, is anyone listening from the right to the left? 
and we made a big mistake in our constitution as well, which uh, I'm sure Dr. Kapila, you'll agree. England is a small country where you live. So the average MP can go out to his or her constituency in the morning and come home to bed in the evening. By the time we start walking in Arunachal Pradesh, before we can reach our distant villages, we're walking 14 days. Mm -hmm. So why do we have 543 constituencies? Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm, you know, I'm basically an Indian. I mean, I, I work at Cambridge, but I think it's, uh, I think it's true. I mean, I think the issue is precisely that these are very few, uh, like our Indian service, our administrative service, which is very small for a very large body. I think this is the same problem uh, one has with the with parliament but uh, you know the institutional architecture was you know and the same thing goes as i said you know, the party funding should have been thought in within as it were the original structures that were put in place i uh, agree with you i mean there was a certain hubris or arrogance that somehow that it was thought that this would all that there would just be one 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 party but okay I'm, Spoken a lot. I mean, I want to hear also from from you know uh, Dr. Palchikar. So it's not. So I couldn't agree more. But I think these things about criminality and all cannot be uh, resolved. My view is it cannot. These cannot be resolved by institutional fixes. They are now very much part and parcel of. I agree with you. I agree. They will need some other kind of rethinking, like from the political process, from the political parties itself. Will not happen as it were from a technocratic, legal, or a bureaucratic fix. Can I interrupt for one second? No, no, I'm I, 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 run in, I ran into the head of a very major political party at the airport. I said, Why have you nominated so many criminals in this election? So he said, uh, you know, when elections are around the corner for us, and by us, he meant all political parties, we have only one mantra, Mr. Chavla, and that is winnability. But after the elections are over, if you call me to sign on the dotted line, I'll be happy to come. He never came. So it's winnability. So what do we do? There are too many complex things, but let's go to Sohasji who's got many thoughts on this. Not really. I, I agree with both of you what you are talking about and this point that it's not merely the institutional architecture that, that something very different uh, needs to be thought about. Uh, I suspect that maybe in the next 10 years time or so, there would be an internal implosion as far as political parties themselves are concerned because they are now finding it very difficult to go ahead with the same system. It's not must merely a question of criminalization. It is a question of money. And if uh, one party gets an obscene amount of money, the other parties are bound to gang up together and say that, okay, let us do something and change the rules in such a fashion that this would be avoided. Number two, individual politicians, whichever party they may belong to, they find actually doing politics getting more and more costly monetarily every day by every election. And therefore, whatever work they are, finally they are going to be there. And if they find that they can't actually engage in politics, then this typical idea that the threshold for ordinary citizens and small parties to enter political competition is very high on the one hand, and this practicality that for even practicing politicians, the act of doing politics is becoming more and more hazardous and costly day by day. Perhaps they might come together at some point of time. And therefore, I wouldn't think of extra imagination to be invested in institutions rather than in politics. In and I think there I couldn't agree more with you. And uh, partly that is why I think as uh, com people writing in the commentary and you're not the guilty party here, but I think that's where I think the fixation on the number is not helpful. <laughs> you know, you laugh, but it's true. Our commentary is very arid. It's very, it's, it's very predictive and arid. We actually, what you have said just now is a wonderful set of, you know, thoughts. These should be part of our conversations. 
Instead, our conversations are always about, you know, which subjati in which, you know, you know, this is the kind of torjod we are doing with numbers. And it's not mm -hmm. that, and at the same time, paradoxically, we actually don't have data. We don't have caste data. You know, we don't have caste data in India. So it, you you could say this is forgive at least some of us for number crunching, because actually what our data shows is exactly this, that, for example, Muslims don't vote as a vote bank. And therefore, this idea that there are vote banks can actually be punctured by the same number crunching that you are talking about. But yes, I agree entirely with you that our analysis is too sort of engaged with pop sociology yes. in terms of or pop demography, for example, yes. social demography. Absolutely. That this jati is this much, so you will get this many votes, and therefore you stand for election and so on and so on. That's right. That's right. That's no, right. I there, there. I agree with you. The second reason why I agree with you, in spite of doing numbers, mm -hmm. is you actually touched the raw nerve. You know, uh, I have been talking about majoritarianism, mm -hmm. and that majoritarianism is not just the majoritarianism that liberal democracies are fraught with generally. Yes. In India, yes. it is about numbers of different communities. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and you <laughs> and this add in point. This, that point. That's a very big problem, and it is the legacy from pre-partition days. Yes. We have been understanding our politics that way. So that way, I think we need to break out of out of that way of thinking because we think about our communities in terms of numbers. Yes, and whether there it is Hindu, Hindu whether it is Muslim. Sorry, it's there. There it is not merely Hindu and Muslim. Yes, that's right. That majoritarianism then also becomes caste majoritarianism. Okay, that's exactly right. Then you are doing this stuff in terms of OBC, Brahmin, you know, Jatav, non Jatav, you know, it's endless. But that is all then you end up doing. And it is a, this is where I think the deep legacy of early 20th century uh, political, you know, conduct and rhetoric has stayed with us. And, and it, has, it has actually become more. Um, bizarrely, it has actually come back with a fervor in the last 15 years. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for all of these thoughts. I just, uh, before I can ask, uh, take up some of the audience questions, some of the last few questions that I had from my end, I think part of this question uh, has already been answered. I wanted to ask um, particularly Dr. Palchikar and uh, Mr. Chavla about how uh, money and criminalization have actually been playing out uh, in elections to the local bodies. And by local bodies, it's specifically mean to panchayats and municipalities. And at the same time, I am also wondering, this is something that is more of a personal question and a thought that's always remained. Uh, what exactly are uh, people voting for at the level of local body elections? Because I can understand, uh, and, and I think you know, it, it's, it's a bit of a paradox that in, in federalism, federalism in its more pristine, most pristine form means that I'm closest to my uh, local representative, but somehow uh, what or who exactly I'm voting for at a local level is something I feel people are still wanting to know. So some thoughts generally on elections to local bodies, how have, uh, as I said, part of the question may have been answered, how has money and criminalization played out at the local level and what exactly or who uh, are people voting for at the local level? You know, uh, to begin with, that's somewhat of a uh, gray area because uh, we are guilty in a sense that we focus more when we study, we focus more on state level and national level elections. That's one. The second is that that is where actually this objection or this criticism about numbers and jati numbers uh, becomes much more applicable at, uh, in terms of both considerations by political parties and in terms of what analysts or commentators or whoever they are, they talk about. Uh, because uh, demographically, we still have communities living in one locality. And therefore, there is always this possibility that you match the two together. Uh, and the third is that uh, whatever name you may give to it, but this exchange of money and the role of money becomes even more direct at the local level much more than in a parliamentary election. In a parliamentary election, it is money poured into the media. Media actually takes the money and then does your job for you. Whereas at the local level, it is more direct exchange of money. And final point, 
parties become practically irrelevant at the local level and it is the candidates who matter whatever little we know about local level elections we find that it is the candidates whether this is good or bad is something debatable uh, because uh, normally ordinarily people should look at the quality of the candidate as well but here the relationship becomes even more personalized something that we are now witnessing even happening at the all india level the relationship between the voter and the voted becoming personalized uh, has its roots in local and state elections so just as you elect a prime minister you elect a cm on a personal basis there is a personalization of the idea of representation at the local level but these are general comments because as i said uh, very limited systematic studies and incidentally state election commissions in many states are not even able to compile election results so if you go to many states you will have to actually hunt down election results for the last maybe 25 years you can't get them very easily i live in a state fortunately where the election commission has put up most of the results of last 20 20 years online uh, on their website but that's exceptional in fact i was just going to uh, pick up a quick point about state election commissions and this is coming from um, uh, this is well not exactly any uh, uh, to do with publication of results or generally uh, any issues but this was about um, an ordinance that came earlier this year this was the andhra pradesh panchayati raj uh, second amendment uh, whereby um, the, the ordinance amended the act uh, the panchayati raj act 1994 and reduced the tenure of the uh, election commissioner uh, from 5 years to 3 years Uh, ultimately it was uh, struck down by the high court supreme court uh, refused to stay the high court order but uh, dr balchikar and also mr chavla some uh, uh, possibly some parting thoughts on issues relating to independence of state election commissions because as i was uh, trying to read this topic i also found the literature in this area was possibly wanting or studies were wanting i'm not entirely sure if that's lack of research on my part but um, any thoughts on uh, independence of state election commissions or functioning of state election commissions and what kind of issues are they are uh, dealing with purely I, I, from I, I, i just repeat what i said that they are in a pathetic condition there is no clear autonomy and legal provisioning for them uh, in most of the states therefore they are entirely dependent upon the state government but let me therefore repeat that unless we understand that the idea of appointing such referring bodies or umpiring bodies in a consultative manner in a bipartisan manner by taking the leader of the opposition also into confidence unless that begins uh, state election commissioners will also be seen as puppets favorites of the existing government so it in a sense goes both ways uh, and uh, i mean if you start looking at who became state election commissioner in which state etc you can very easily find out the relationships and that is something tragic so uh, that's that's i mean less said the better i will leave it to the dirty work to mr chawla to do <laughs> uh, mr chawla any well you know <laughs> i am i'm sitting in jaipur and i won't take names but there was a man of great integrity uh, who was appointed the state election commissioner uh, but his sense of integrity didn't suit uh, his appointing authority so it was inevitable that a clash would come sooner or later it came sooner than later and it translated in what sohas bhai has just said he wouldn't get he was not able to get staff he really got an office it took months to get a computer i mean every obstacle that could be put was was put so uh, things broke down and so the record is uneven and you are absolutely right when you say that not enough work not enough study has been done there the sinusure of all eyes is usually the central election commission but we do forget that the state election commissioner is also a constitutional appointee yes exactly right. appointed by the constitution and should have the same protection under the constitution as say we were supposed to have or have right. and and you're right much more work needs to be done here uh, so there's food for thought in vidhi in vidhi 
just that, in fact, I was, I was just going to point out that there were some glaring uh, constitutional law issues with that ordinance because whoever was the incumbent uh, election commissioner in uh, in Andhra Pradesh had to step down and a new one had to be appointed, and that's what the ordinance said. And that uh, that clearly was 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 a major uh, operated as an Article 14 violation. So there were a bunch of issues with this constitution uh, with this ordinance. So that, that's where this thought came from. That uh, has there been enough study about state election commissions, mm. or, uh, or, or are we severely lacking um, in this regard? So uh, that's where that's where most of this intrigue came from. Uh, I'll just take a few questions uh, from the uh, from the audience. We have some questions on. I think we have about. A few questions on chat messages, um, and this is uh, to you by uh, Mr. Chavla and Dr. Pal Shikhar. Um, the question is: uh, What is the need and relevance of Section 11 of the Representation of the People Act, 1951, today? Uh, is it really worthwhile to remove and reduce the disqualifications of the contesting candidates? Uh, how does this section benefit our nation? Uh, this is with specific respect to Section 11, which is removal or reduction of a period of disqualification. Of the RBI. Hmm. Dr. Sohas, on to you. No, not really. I wouldn't go into this because I'm generally skeptical of uh, very technical uh, provisions in, um, being introduced in the law. Hmm. And the question is not about disqualification, but the causes for those disqualifications, they being generally political, uh, I think we should, we need to focus on those clauses. Hmm. Number two, the overall response to the specific question would be that it's time that we need to look at the architecture of the representation of People's Act more generally, rather than looking piecemeal at this provision or that provision, because that doesn't serve any purpose. Somebody doesn't like this and therefore talks about that. But the point is, what kind of a law now, seven decades later, do we need, which would include some of the issues that Dr. Kapila was mentioning earlier, like about party funding, about election expenses, and so on and so forth, and also about the autonomy of the election authorities, etc. Uh, I agree. I, I think I think you raised a very valid point, and it's come out of this question. Yes, we do need to seriously relook at that Act of 1950 and 51. A long time has passed, and we've gathered a lot of experience. Mm, that's true, sir. Uh, there's we one more question, um, and uh, Dr. Kapila, uh, maybe you could take this one. Um, the question is: So, uh, what is the general view of the panel about apparently biased uh, corporate political old uh, news channels, which have the possibility of molding public perspective? Uh, right before elections, possibly in a bit to hurt uh, uh, democracy in India. Uh, any thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Kapila? Okay, now having said that, I don't believe in technical, don't have such, don't think that the issue is at the technical legal level. I think in this instance, there is. But I do think we do need firmer laws and uh, firmer regulations, certainly. Uh, I remember having a discussion with the head of Facebook in India, you know, two years ago or a year ago in one of the Vidhi debates. And uh, I think, yeah, I can't remember again with Rajdeep and Orgo, I can't, you know, it's sort of there. And the idea that, you know, certainly, um, you know, what Cambridge, just a one story from, you know, very small Cambridge Analytica player could wreak, wreak so much havoc on, on one, only one election, which was actually, had to be then redone it tells you that big data requires a regulation. It, you know, these companies need to be brought into the purview in the way they say, you know, newspapers oh, yes. publishers are. So, you know, we certainly need that regulation. And we also need to certainly think a little bit more about television in the same way. Uh, you know, that what is, you know, and you're getting some of the, you know, that, you know it should be, uh, it again should become a little bit more transparent from where the money is coming from, uh, you know, how the ratings are being, you know, such, it should just be available. I'm not, you know, I, the regulation, there is an architecture for media regulation, but it's toothless. It's, a, you know, so, but I think my prime concern would be on the big beasts. We can't do everything. And the big beasts are where you are recording this on Facebook. Uh, it is, you know, it is, these, these are the companies, you know, which are which have probably the most 
uh, now the nows to manipulate not just voting but electoral behavior uh, over 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 a substantial period of time. So yes, we India needs may, to. May I just come in for a second? I think this is a very vital point. I think perhaps this is the greatest danger. Information is the new oil. Mark Zuckerberg has still not appeared before the Commons or the Lords. Um, uh, he's been fined two billion by Congress, and uh, the kind of power that they have collectively, as we saw in the 2016 election in the U.S. and uh, and what happened to Hillary Clinton, this is the great power, and uh, and social media. When my book was launched, uh, I had mm, as a guest uh, Sunil Arora, my friend and colleague. And this question was asked in the audience. So I asked him to come up and uh, could he answer this, which he very gamely did because he wasn't part of the panel and he was part of the audience. And, he, and the question was that how can the current model uh, code of conduct apply to social media, Cambridge Analytica, um, all these uh, huge giants who are all merging together and finally, uh, it comes down in the end to Twitter. And Twitter is reaching everybody a hundred times a day. So by now, most people in social media know my likes, my dislikes, they play to them, but more importantly, they play to my prejudices. Mm. And that's the danger. And that, as you say, Dr. Bal, I think you're absolutely right, Dr. Kapila when you say this, that I think this is the biggest danger yeah. for us now. Yeah. Um, we have one other question, uh, and uh, we have, uh, with the recent controversy during the, count, uh, during the counting in Bihar elections, what can possibly be done to bring more transparency during the count, uh, counting process? And I think that sort of goes back to uh, point uh, that Mr. Chavla made in the beginning that controversies um, regarding the results uh, as they arise in the US are not as frequent in India, but currently if this, if, if we see the Bihar example and possibly a few more, what possible steps can be taken uh, to bring transparency, particularly during the counter counting process? Um, you know, um, there, was, there was a small innovation, no, a good innovation that I came out with in 2009 which has now become a standard operating procedure. I had wanted that amount of police force and I didn't get it. So what I did was that I had video cameras record everything, uh, every polling station and all the counting so that it could be admissible in evidence. Now this time because of COVID and other reasons, everything became slower. So when it became slower, naturally at that time of counting tension is very high. Uh, there always is. And uh, the process had become inexorably slower than yeah. it had become before, fueling further suspicion. Um, but it was all recorded. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so in the election petitions that may have been filed, of which I'm not aware, uh, the orders that I had given then and will, which will always remain, because they'll be very difficult to withdraw, is that for six months, the district magistrate returning officers and county people have to keep under safe custody uh, all the films that have been recorded because six months is given for an election petition. And up till now, I have not read of any uh, major election petition on this aspect of counting, but it may emerge. Okay. May emerge. There is time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chavla, on that. Um, one question that uh, I've, I've uh, been thinking about, and this is particularly uh, after the news that came out, uh, I think yesterday or day before, was uh, about uh, the EC possibly, uh, the, the EC permitting NRIs to cast their vote from overseas by means of postal ballots. And uh, generally, uh, Mr. Chavla, one, one question uh, that I thought I would particularly ask you is, generally in the context of preparation of electoral rolls and the increased occupational mobility of voters across India, uh, how have the constitutional values attached to the principle of universal franchise practically unfolded? Um, any thoughts on that, Mr. Chavra? Yeah, I'm full of thoughts. 
full of thoughts that all leading to controversy. <laughs> but you see, the thing is uh, that uh, the NRIs basically, and particularly the NRIs in Kerala, and the MPs and MLAs in Kerala have, have been demanding that because there's such a large um, uh, group of NRIs um, in, um, in the Gulf and elsewhere. Uh, now, uh, we have difficulties. In, in this matter, uh, uh, first one must know is that by the time candidate, candidature is declared, it's usually just 15 days before polling date. Um, you know, political candidates don't choose their candidates six months before. So we are squeezed to 15 or 16 or 14 days. Now, in that time, ballot papers are certainly can be electronic uh, and, and sent electronically. But, uh, but when uh, the Indian missions were asked whether they would certi certify those, uh, they refused because they said that they don't have the wherewithal to do it. Right. Now, now the, the ballot paper can be sent off electronically all over to whoever asks and, and somebody can tick mark something, but who's going to verify that? And we haven't even been able to bring in computer, computers into this because we haven't developed sufficient firewalls. In India, we lose and win by one vote. That has also been known to happen. Mm -hmm. We're a very cantankerous people. We run to courts at the drop of a hat. So we'll be flooded. So first we have 14 days, then we are sending it. Then the Indian Foreign Service says, no, we don't have the wherewithal uh, to certify. So, so when, when something comes back, certainly the election commission doesn't have the wherewithal to certify either. So while the idea is good, how do we implement it fairly? Because at the drop of a hat, um, the person who loses the first election will be in the Supreme Court and there will be for years. No, so we've got to think this out to its last mile. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Dr. Chavla. Um, we uh, don't have any more questions uh, from the audience. So um, I just want to thank all the panelists uh, for, for joining us, for, for kindly agreeing uh, to be part of this panel. Okay, just one moment. Yeah. Since there are no questions just... from the panel, I think the question about NRIs, uh, Mr. Chawla answered the logistic part about it, which is fine. The larger question is, uh, how do you decide what length of residence is or shortness of residence is required for being eligible to be a voter? And uh, to put it in an inverse manner, uh, how do we ensure in the first place that our migrant labor are registered as voters and they are allowed to vote? Uh, if you look at the proportion and then the priorities, I think politics and all policies require some kind of a sense of priority. And if you are talking of sense of priority, then between diaspora and migrant labor, I would say that the election commission and those who are supporting the vote for NRIs should entirely devote their energy first to ensure to go to the last mile to have migrant laborers register as voters, minorities register as voters, marginalized sections register as voters, and actually get to exercise their right to vote. Otherwise, this would look as pseudo-democratic that okay, you Indians living there and then you don't give them the right to vote. So I'm rather skeptical about that as a proposal, not just on uh, logistic grounds. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, I also think that's in a way good to go back to the American elections just as a kind of thing. That has been so critical for this election that actually the minority, uh, the black minority yes. voting registration has been critical for, and therefore their postal vote which is also, on, on the postal vote itself, which is also about marginalized communities in the US, which has ensured also this result, to be honest. So I think, you know, I would be very worried about a focus on the NRI, even though I may gain from it. Yes. <laughs> you know, precisely because I think it will be at the cost of the undocumented migrant worker who would probably come from, as it were, a poorer background from India who would probably be marginalized in the first instance, who will be disenfranchised. 
So I think it's a very, it's a can of worms. Uh, I, I actually think the, if you really want this, then you should just go the whole hog and do, which is something now heretical, which is not something I support in any way, but actually then to go for full dual citizenship. Because then you actually make people responsible in two countries rather than giving them some rights here, some rights not there. And it allows also for the undocumented worker in the Gulf who doesn't have papers there to at least have papers in this country. So I think, you know, um, it's, I think giving it to NRIs is a terrible halfway house. It, it will only, it will actually a privileged mobile community in India, the diaspora, you know, in that particular case. So, sorry, I didn't mean to butt in, but I think for it. Yeah. No, what you said, Dr. Kapila, is something I hope you are in India long enough because yes. there's so much to discuss on that as well. I am here, so I'd be very delighted. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. And Dr. Parshan. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that came up here towards the end because I was going to ask a closing remarks, and I think those are very those are thoughtful uh, remarks to actually end this discussion with. So thank you very much, Dr. Paljikar, for bringing this up at the end. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kapila and Mr. Chavla and Dr. Paljikar for kindly agreeing to uh, participate in this panel today. We were very to have you. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the discussion. Uh, thanks a lot to all our attendees also for uh, coming and attending the discussion. Thanks to everyone who posted questions. Um, please do keep a lookout for uh, future Vidhi events on our social media pages and as well as on the Vidhi website. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being here. Uh, goodbye. Thanks. And thank you for conducting this so well for somebody who's only got thumbs and no fingers. I can't tell you with how much difficulty I got on. No, no worries. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night.